thank you for joining our uh, session on not business as usual, transforming your business model. I'm David Reddick. I'll be speaking to you later, but uh, I have the honor of going over the agenda and introducing our first um, speaker. So we will uh, keep this to a tight two hours today. And we will be, uh, the, the uh, agenda for today is to talk about different perspectives and hear different ideas on how to turn um, the, the current business environment into a learning environment. Um, uh, we want to talk about, and what I've seen is different businesses approach this situation different ways. Some tend to turtle up and protect themselves. Some uh, uh, run from the situation, but those who are the most successful are taking this as an opportunity to learn more about them, their business themselves and how to, um, how to move forward after, after the uh, uh, economic challenges caused by the current coronavirus and work from home and, and uh, some of the stay from home orders. So it'll be really exciting. Our first speaker today is, um, uh, pardon me, Lindsay Blues, who is the executive director for Madison Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, I will uh, uh, turn this over to her. And uh, Lindsay will be uh, leading a roundtable with a uh, few local business leaders. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, we're really excited today. We have four fantastic panelists of um, small businesses in the Madison area. Uh, we have Colleen Sutton with Richwood on the River. Uh, hi, Colleen. Uh, Beth Lewis with Old, uh, Old Time Marketplace. Um, Doug Ungru with Kaler Tire. And Chip George with The Attic. Um, and so guys, I'm just gonna go ahead and start off with you all and ask you a couple of questions. Um, so can you briefly describe to me the current situation, how it's transformed your operations, and then what kind of creative solutions that you've found? Uh, right now at this moment, uh, we are uh, slowly reopening. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have two businesses in my one business. One is a full service bed and breakfast. My other is wedding venue. Uh, we were completely closed, have been completely closed uh, as soon as the Kentucky governor asked us uh, to stay healthy at home. Uh, but we are now able <clears throat> to reopen our bed and breakfast business. So we have not had any guests, but we are able to uh, comply with all of the CDC guidelines and uh, I've actually taken three reservations in the last 24 hours. So we're excited, we're, we're modifying, uh, we're doing a lot of things differently. Um, like I said, keeping with the CDC guidelines and, uh, and we're happy to comply. And what we're really doing is listening to our guests and what their concerns are and how we can minimize their fear um, if anything, so that's really key for my business is listening to my guests and what they're wanting um, us to do and if we're capable of doing that. And then we're keeping our fingers crossed that we'll be uh, having our first wedding here come mid-June. Oh, that's fantastic, Colleen. Um, a follow-up question to you, um, are, do you have like a, a, a set of questions for your staff or for yourself when you're talking to, um, you know, potential people coming into the area on you know what kind of questions you ask them to make sure that you are listening to the right things that they're giving you the right information. Um, so fortunately for me, I I don't have a very large staff here. Um, so most of the questions that are coming from our customers are fielded directly to me. Um, my other staff are kind of in the background working um, and not necessarily communicating or even seeing our guests, which I think is one of the questions that I am getting from people that are wanting to come to the property is how many people will they have the possibility of interacting with? That is the big question right now that I'm getting. Once again, my business is very different than other people's businesses I have the capability of actually never even seeing my guests if that's what they want they can do self check-in I can put continental breakfast items in their cabin um, so that's been the big question and then the second question that I'm getting a lot from my guests are our cleaning processes do we have hand sanitizer 
um, what the, the time frame is in between when one guest was in that room and when I'm taking reservations for another guest. So I don't specifically have a list of questions that maybe I'm asking them, um, but being in the wedding industry, I'm used to being bombarded with a ton of questions um, and having to come up uh, with an answer uh, quickly um, and also being confident in my question and being able to execute that. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Beth, let's go to you next, just because I see your face uh, sooner at the top of my screen. Um, Beth, tell us a little bit about the, um, from the retail side of things, um, how has this transformed your business and what kind of creative things have you been doing? Thanks, Lindsay. Um, one of the things that we started to implement very quickly um, after we had to close, we've been closed since March 22nd, um, during that, those first days, I knew that I needed to, uh, I needed to stay relevant in the industry, and that was very important to me. I took a look at how I had tried to build up my social media presence over the years, and I felt as though it was time to really um, put some emphasis on the uh, website, onto my online presence as well. And so we really ramped up. Um, we really made a goal to be present online in Facebook and Instagram daily throughout the day to let people know that we were there and we were viable and we were still, um, we were still active. And we wanted to make sure that people knew that we could um, still maintain our level of customer service even though you couldn't get the old time marketplace experience through the brick and mortar, you could still get it through online. And by doing so, we learned a lot. We learned that we have only touched the peak of what is capable for social media and how that can help make your business successful. And we also learned the importance of maintaining a regular schedule there. And with all of those things that we have done during this time are things that we are excited to continue to implement um, as we are slowly opening up. And it's actually been an exciting um, process to see uh, once you're given some time <laughs> to try some new things, it's interesting to see how those aspects that we have put into place now can only help increase and grow our business going forward. And that has been a reward that has been uh, surprisingly pleasant. That's, that's really great to hear, Beth. Thank you very much. Uh, Chip, can we hear a little bit from you and how the attic and, and from a restaurant perspective, um, how this situation has transformed your business and what kind of creative things you guys have been working on? Well, we're also a restaurant and a gift shop. We're the attic and coffee mill cafe. And so early on, right before they had the stay at home orders, we had already switched over to carry out um, containers and not having to do dishes and people touching dishes and eating and using forks and utensils. And so when they issued the stay at home order and the carry out only for restaurants, we were kind of already ready to go. We had already removed uh, condiments like sugars and straws and, and that type of thing from the, the public counter area so people aren't touching going in to grab their sweetener and touch multiple sweeteners that they're not even using so everything is now behind the counter and we we hand those things to people as they need it and so we instantly kind of just went to the carry out and the uh the curbside ordering people calling in on the phone and ordering we stopped using the people's uh, reusable mugs and cups as they brought them in so we wouldn't have a lot of touching of other things and not knowing how clean those cups are and etc. cetera. Um, and so we just started with all that and we kind of closed off our most of our shopping area for gifts and just focused on the restaurant and the coffee aspect. We instituted some things like bulk items, we quarts of uh, our soups, our popular soups, and gallons of our popular iced teas. And that helped with a lot of uh, business because we would post those through, we did a lot of social media, we used Facebook and Instagram. And with the development of the Madison, Indiana, You Gotta Eat Facebook page, 
we were able to reach more people and post our menus and specials and different things were going on. And we definitely noticed an uptick in sales due to that. One of the other things that we have focused on during this time, because we also limited our hours, we, we are always closed on Sunday, but we stopped on Saturday being open because that tends to be a big tourist day. And we kind of felt like on Saturday, our local public would normally just should be home. And we just gives us time, gave us extra time to recoup and get ready for the next week. But um, one of the things that we've been doing during this time is focusing on projects that we have a hard time getting done during our normal business hours. We always have a bucket list, so to speak, of, you know, th this needs to be painted, this needs to go to storage, all this has to be done. And that is helping us prepare to be ready when things do reopen fully, that we have some of these things that are that we've taken care of that will help and benefit us as we go forward. But definitely the, uh, the public has done great with our carry out. And of course we practice social distancing in there for a while until just this week, we were only having one person in the restaurant at the time and making sure people are trying to call in their orders ahead of time so we can eliminate the walk-in. The walk-in person tended to throw off our whole system and uh, people just walking in and saying, oh, well, I'm not sure what I want. I'd like to have some lunch today. And then we're in the middle of uh, taking phone calls and credit cards and processing orders and to get ready to go out the door. So that has been a challenge with just walk-ins, whether that's just for a cup of coffee or, or uh, lunch. Hey, Chip. Um, Doug, can we hear from you a little bit about, um, from Kaler Tire, I'd love to hear from you about, you know, how it's transformed your operations and what you've done creatively to solve those issues. Okay. Um, so I'll touch on both like the tire store and the welding store. Um, so like the tire store, for example, there's a waiting room and we've had to eliminate some seating in there um, and it's it's been pretty much not business as usual but same hours for the most part they had to cut Saturdays out over the tire store <clears throat> but um, yeah just trying to eliminate seating in the waiting room so if people you know are gonna come in you're definitely six to ten feet apart and there's only like two or three seats now where there used to be ten or twelve um, and over on the welding store we have eliminated any sort of walk-ins so it's call ahead, curbside delivery only. And then we have delivery trucks that are going out to places and we're just kind of following each, um, each customer's demands as far as some places want to want to do temperature scans. Um, some places don't want you to come in the, the gates at all and just kind of drop everything outside. Um, so we're just kind of adhering to what other people want. And as far as our customers go, we're just trying to stay connected and, and figure out if there's anything we can do to help them. Um, but I would say like our overall cleanliness is a big thing now, just trying to always disinfect in the mornings and at nights, and just try to wipe down counters. And we've got like a bulk spray disinfectant that we actually got from Madison Chemical um, that we can mix ourselves and just been using that to spray everything down and try to keep all the surfaces and handles and light switches um, clean because we have had people um, still coming in the office every day throughout all this because we didn't have to, it was a big pride point of ours, but we didn't have to let anybody go or do any sort of temporary layoffs or anything like that. Um, a few people chose to work a few less hours, but for the most part, it was um, the same same people on staff all throughout the whole time. So we were proud to be able to do that for them. That's great, Doug. And and just from um, you know when I went into Kaler Tire recently, they were fantastic about. Um, wiping down my car keys, wiping down my credit card when they handed it back to me. Um, and I felt completely comfortable and in my own space in the waiting room. And that was very important to me um, because I have someone at risk in my household. So I'm very careful about those sorts of things. So I was very appreciative of that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. Sorry, what big challenges are you still looking to solve for Taylor Tire and Taylor Welding? Um, mainly on the welding side right now, we're trying to get, it's nothing we can really control, but we're just trying to see if supply is catching up with demand because we deal with a lot of PPE supplies before this even. And so we've really, you know, looked at what people are asking for and are needing. And so we've ordered over 45,000 masks. Um, we've got over 20,000 masks already in and distributed. 
we've got another 25,000 out on order right now. So these are like the, the cheaper, more throwaway style masks, um, the medical like blue masks that people, you know, are going to use for a day probably and get rid of them. But just trying to keep in touch with our customers again and, and, you know, just have that kind of stuff so that when they go back to work, uh, manufacturers in general, when they go back to work, they, they can feel safe and their employees can feel safe. So we're trying to just listen to what they're asking for and just hoping that supply finally catches up. So we've had a lot of these orders canceled. We, we order nitro gloves all the time and they're getting canceled left and right. And we may order 10,000 and get, you know, a thousand or 2,000 of these gloves. And the same thing with the mask. We're, we're told it might be three or four weeks and then, you know, five weeks comes around and we've got a few of them, but not all of them. It's just you're kind of at their mercy a little bit and a lot of the stuff is supposedly still coming from China so we're just having you know sit back and wait essentially because I guess the Chinese government has stopped some of these shipments of these masks and gloves and things and, and it's not just the US reallocating to healthcare. care um, it's more from what I've heard the Chinese government actually saying no you can't have this many we're gonna keep some here too so that's a challenge is just trying to actually get the stuff in our hands and then we can get it out to people. Sure. Um, and um, while we're still <clears throat> speaking with you, are there parts of the business model that you've already changed that you think you're going to keep moving forward? Um, I would say the cleanliness is a big one. We're going to, we're going to stay with that um, as long as we can, basically, or as long as, you know, everyone says it's essential to do. Just because, like you said, it makes everybody feel safer if you wipe things down. If you see that, you know, your credit card is wiped down and handed back to you and you're not feeling unsafe or if you're someone at risk at home. So we're going to do that for sure. And then for the foreseeable future, we're going to keep with the curbside delivery and, and keeping people out of the welding store. Just because most of the time people know what they want. Um, it's, it's not like you're going into a, an attic gift shop where you're not really sure what you're looking for. Most of the time people have an idea of what they're getting. So I don't feel like it impacts people that much. Um, so we're going to try to keep up with that as long as we can. I think that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So going back to Chip then, um, Chip, what other big challenges are you all looking to solve still? Well, with the new orders this week of allowing retail to be open, we did do that this week, this yesterday. And um, our biggest concern with that and then moving forward into these different stages that the governor has laid out is monitoring people coming in, how many people are in the store, what are they touching when they're browsing for something and picking up a gift item and then putting it back down, just like you might at the grocery store. You pick up a can of something and say, well, I don't want that, put it back. You know, monitoring those kinds of things and how many people are coming in the door and the phone calls that are coming in and still doing curbside and takeout, that's going to be a challenge as we move forward into the different stages that allow you to have uh, more people in your, in your business, especially come May 11th with the 50% capacity restaurant dine in. At this time, we do not think we are going to participate in that because we're not, we don't have a lot of seats in our restaurant. And so to go 50%, it almost is more work than it might be worth to have people dine in, sanitize the tables and chairs after they leave, and still trying to do carry out and, and uh, monitoring people in the store and wandering around and social distancing and all the safety measures that we need to do as far as masks and gloves and, and sanitizing uh, the, the store as people are in and out. And so, you know, we're constantly wiping down the front door as people push the door open and then pull it open as they leave. And we haven't had our bathroom open. So then that creates another uh, challenge of keeping that sanitized and clean. And we just don't know if 50% dining capacity is worth our effort. It would be better for us to continue doing curbside and um, carry out. One of the other challenges that I see for our whole community is no matter what business you're in, or even if you're not in business, is that we're a small community. What we have close to 30 cases of coronavirus confirmed, something 28, 29, I can't remember exactly the number. 
And compared to a lot of places like uh, Indianapolis, Louisville, and other places where people will be coming here for tourism, it's the tourism that I think will be a challenge because as we have this small community and low number of cases, what happens when people are coming from Indianapolis to spend the day here or the weekend here in, a, in an establishment, uh, you know, uh, overnight stay? And what are they, what are they bringing with them? What are their, what is their situation as far as uh, being asymptomatic or, or being, have been exposed in places that have had a much more um, greater number of cases and, and transmissions and stuff. And um, I will say this also, that that is a concern. The tourism part is we get people in, even during this lockdown, we have had people come in and say, oh, I'm from Indianapolis and I just wanted to get out for the day and I came down and just to get a cup of coffee. I've been to Madison before. And then we're like, wait a minute, maybe you should have stayed back home. I, I, I don't know. It's one of those things that everybody's probably experienced in business of how you might, how comfortable are you with that? Uh, you know, right when this started, we closed down the hospital store in the lobby of the hospital because our, we had two employees that weren't comfortable. And then at that time, we weren't really sure how many cases the hospital might receive. And we kind of felt like, okay, that would be the ground zero for Madison as far as uh, people with the coronavirus going in and out of the hospital and being treated. And we kind of felt, well, let's just close that shop down. But we are now open. We opened yesterday and uh, with no, no difference in the hours, just uh, basically we're serving staff up there because they don't have visitation and they don't have a lot of people coming in from the public. Yeah, so those seem like, um, you know, definitely things to, to keep in mind and to think about. And, you know, we're talking a lot about tourists and everything. Colleen and Beth, I'm sure you all can speak to that. Um, and and actually, let's go ahead and go back to Colleen. And, and Colleen, tell us what big challenges you're still facing, uh, which I'm sure are a lot uh, with your type of business. And then, um, you know, what parts of your, you know, the changes that you've made are you um, looking to keep long term? Um, so, you know, I would say right now, uh, my biggest challenge that is presenting itself is my wedding couples being told by many of their guests that even if they continued with their wedding this year, they probably would not feel safe coming. So I'm having a lot of very anxious couples calling me with wanting me to really tell them what to do. Um, and of course, that's difficult because as a business owner, I want to explain to them that I can do their wedding, but it may look very different from what their vision of their wedding was going to be. So that's been the biggest challenge right now and actually a new challenge over the last couple of weeks. Um, I definitely pride myself on keeping calm uh, and being a voice of reason uh, for these very uh, emotional um, couples right now and and I try to to really feel that and be empathetic towards that at the same time also still maintaining my stand on what my business can do for them um, so definitely um, a very big challenge social distancing uh, will will be a challenge we're very fortunate that I have a large venue um, I've been talking with some tent companies that I work with uh, if we did a 50 person or a 100 person event, uh, we can self distance, we can do family pods. So that's, um, you know, going to be a challenge, but something that I'm, I'm happy to accept. Uh, and then I think I mentioned earlier, fear is always going to be um, a big issue. I think Chip just kind of, you know, talked a little bit about that. Um, I am of the mindset that I cannot control other people's fears. Um, they're going to have them, uh, you know, and present them. Um, I can control how I respond to that and how I feel confident that my business can run with, especially I'm in the hospitality business. I thrive on people coming from Indianapolis, Louisville, um, actually from people all over the world. We've had South Africa, Korea, um, China, you know, here. So not recently. Uh, travel has been banned, so I don't, you know, have, but th my business thrives on people coming from all over. So it's really about how I can uh, calm those fears and how I can control my environment here at Richwood. 
things that I think that I will continue that we are doing now, um, especially on the bed and breakfast side, we will, we can do, like I said, self check-ins. I think that that will actually be a great uh, business model that we hadn't really done before. It will free up some of my staff time and having to wait till nine, sometimes 10 o'clock at night uh, to check people in. So continuing the self check-in. Um, extra sanitizing, so that's definitely something we're very, you know, clean venue to begin with, um, but just visually showing people that we are keeping on top of the sanitizing um, and calming their fears about that, uh, I think will be really important. Limited staff will be something that I um, have implemented and then will continue to implement. Um, so we can have a longer period of time where one staff person is working as opposed to having multiple staff here during an event. And, uh, and then the most important, once again, continuing to listen to my clients, my customers, and what I can do for them and it's what's in their best interest. That's great perspective, Colleen, thank you. Um, Beth, I know you talked a little bit about um, the parts of your business model uh, changes that you're gonna keep, um, but can you tell us a little bit more about that and what big challenges you have yet to solve for your business? Sure. Um, one of the biggest things that we um, that we did uh, change is we have had a website, but did not devote enough time to um, making it like e-commerce worthy. We always would have a few things on there. Um, so what we we really focused a lot of our attention on to wanting to give people an old time marketplace experience online. And the, the payoff on, on having the website, even if you don't have an e-commerce site to generate revenue, obviously, but you need to, it's so important to have a presence on there. You really can't fathom the amount of people that you can reach um, by, by being you know, visible online. And I've encouraged a couple people um, that were not ready to delve into the e-commerce aspect of it, but at least to give yourself the chance to be able to connect with other people. Um, you don't know what other opportunities or possibilities are lying out there. Um, if you don't have a presence, people can't find you. And you want to make it easy for people to find you. So um, I recently did an Instagram post encouraging people to take a look at some things that don't cost any money to help build your business uh, in the background. You know, now is not the time to hide and it's actually the time to grow. You want to uh, get online, take a class, build your brand, focus on a logo. All of those things uh, you can either do yourself or get online to do and some of them don't cost any money. These are all things that can help maintain and grow your business as we navigate all of this. Um, some, of the, some of the difficulties that we have encountered are with the supply chain. There's certain things that we can't get a hold of right now. Um, so you just start digging and looking for an alternative. Maybe uh, the best part is, is there's usually something better and that's what is so exciting. So um, doing those things have helped us we look forward to uh, even growing those things that we've implemented during this time that can just help our business grow. Thank you, Beth. That's fantastic. Thank you to all of our panelists, Colleen, Chip, Doug, uh, Beth, thank you so much. Um, we have to wrap things up here for our panel discussion, um, but we are going to toss this up online uh, later with the recording. So if anybody wants to go back and, and uh, recap what was said, uh, we'll put that up. Uh, and I'm sure that if anybody has questions for any of our panelists, um, that they'll, they would be willing uh, to answer those. So shoot those questions over. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand things over um, to uh, John Myers with uh, ISBDC, and uh, he's going to take it from here. John? Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm John Myers. I'm with the Indiana Small Business Development Center, and we are a uh, free and confidential service um, to help small businesses in any way that we can. Uh, typically, we're helping people get started and figure out how they're going to fund their business and how the operations of their business is, is going to work. Um, we've had to pivot as well recently and be more reactionary to the COVID-19 uh, restrictions and, and help businesses try to figure out how to navigate that um, and recover from, from this. Um, and I want to thank our, our panelists today uh, for giving us some uh, very 
real world um, experiences on how they've, they've dealt with this. Um, what I'm gonna talk to you about today is called the Business Model Canvas. And the Business Model Canvas is a um, tool that you can use to think about your business model and detail some of the aspects um, in, in how your business, business works. Uh, your business model is basically how you create value for other people and convert that into value for yourself and your stakeholders. And when you think about um, the business model canvas, it's split into big picture, it's split into two halves, and then more nuanced, it's into nine sections. And if you think about each of those nine sections, you can identify areas uh, where you can change your business model and drill down into little into more specifics in order to see how everything needs to work um, together for your business to, to be successful. So I'm going to attempt to share a document here. All right, there it is. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm also in the chat box. Well, I apologize. Yeah, in the chat area, if there is a chat area, I'm going to put my uh, email address. If anybody has any questions, please email me. And I'm also gonna leave a link to a video that, uh, describes the business model canvas also. So, you know, we'll go over a lot today. And then if you need a refresher, you can go back and, and visit that video. Okay. So you've, um, originally the business model canvas was designed to be like a whiteboard experiment. And I ad advise if you have some uh, stakeholders or some key employees that you sit down with them and you brainstorm through this process to see how uh, your business model can react to everything that's going on. Um, first of all, everybody has had to pivot. You have had to um, change your business model uh, because of the restrictions that have happened. And in the next phase, you're gonna have to change your business model again uh, ongoing because things aren't gonna go back to how they were uh, pre-COVID-19. So if you uh, take a look at my picture here, we have the business model canvas, and I like to think of it as two sections, big picture. The right half is what I like to call the front of your business. The left half is the back of your business. And the front of your business are all the places where you're interacting with your customers. The back of the business is all the things that have to go on behind the scenes that the customers don't see. I like to say that the customers often see you uh, bringing in all the money. They don't see you paying the bills at the end of the month. Um, there's more to it than that, of course. So the, the first, the front of your business is your customer segments, your customer relationships, your value proposition, your channels, and your revenue streams. The back of your business are your key partners, your key activities, your key resources, and your cost structure. Okay, I'm gonna to move to my next slide here. I'm gonna try to anyway, here we go. So probably the most important um, part of your business model is your customer segment. Um, if you're a business and you don't have customers, you're, you won't be a business very long. So typically when you, um, when I talk to businesses and ask them, who's your customer? The answer is everybody's my customer. And of course, anybody who wants to spend uh, their money with you is certainly welcome to in your business and certainly please do business with them. But if you're gonna be spending your time and your energy and your money and your resources to try to get customers in, then we need to think about who the specific customer is that we're actually trying to target. And in this case of COVID-19, as we're rethinking who our customer is, are there customer segments that maybe um, you've missed? Are there customer segments that you've neglected? Are there customers 
who maybe um, weren't interested in your business before, but now some things have changed and they're a little more interested in, in what you have to offer. Maybe because you're local and that's more important to them now, or maybe because um, they're more interested in how a business is doing its uh, hygiene and, and maintaining things. So uh, your customers, uh, your, psychologically, your customers have changed. Um, there's no doubt about that. And what they're looking for out of a business has changed. And now it's the opportunity for you to uh, identify how those customers, your existing customers have changed and then target uh, who, uh, who potential new customer segments are. Okay, so we wanna think about who our customers, what their lives are like, um, what their interests are, um, how their, um, what their challenges are in life and what are, what are problems that they're trying to solve. And certainly now with COVID-19, uh, there's a lot of problems to, to solve. So uh, we like to think that you, you think about a, um, a ideal customer. And I like to think about three or four customer segments for the purpose of this business model to try to keep it simple um, and, and really have focus. And think about a specific customer um, that you would want to clone. If I had this customer and I could clone them and have 20 of these customers, who, who is this person? Um, what are they like? What are their interests? Uh, what are their challenges? What social media are they um, involved in, if any? What advertising do they, uh, do they look at? What, um, do they watch TV? Do they read the newspaper? What are their values? What are things that are important to them? Um, think about all of these things that, that make up a person. Um, if there's any Kurt Vonnegut fans out there, uh, Kurt Vonnegut once said that he, uh, whenever you write, you should have a reader in mind, a specific reader. In all of his novels, he said he wrote for his sister because he knew that she would get the jokes and the, and the nuances and, and appreciate what he had to say. So we're thinking about what are our specific uh, uh, customers. We had one client come into our office who did this section of their business model canvas as a comic book character. So they invented comic book characters for each of their customers. And it was a really good way to get to understand uh, what's going on in the heart and mind of that customer. And there are some things to think about in our customer segment. And um, some of this stuff has changed. I know uh, Beth was talking about how her online sales have changed. So she's reaching out to a broader um, audience. So one of uh, when we're looking for customer markets, uh, the geography is important. Are you looking for somebody that's in your town? You're looking for somebody who's in Madison? Are you um, more if you're tourist oriented, are you bringing people in from 50 miles away, from 100 miles away? What's your what's your target area there, or are there are you global and it's anybody in the country or it's anybody in the world that you could reach out to? And is this an opportunity there? Um, if you were just a business who's been focused on people who walk into your brick and mortar, is this now the opportunity to expand that reach and to do things more online? Um, and then to, another thing to think about with our customer segment is the demographic. Uh, what's their income, uh, gender, age group, education level, those sorts of things play into who a person is. Um, psychographic, what are their attitudes, what are their values, what are their lifestyle? Um, is, somebody, is this somebody who values buying local? Is this somebody who values um, buying small, um, small batch things? Um, is this somebody who is interested in, in you know, people who are being very hygienic and how has this changed for, for your customers? And we also have behavioral. Um, what are people kind of normally used to doing and how do they usually find products and services and do they have brand loyalties and are there similar um, repeated usages? And is that going to change? Um, are you, do you have uh, people who maybe uh, are going to be afraid to come into your place now because of COVID-19? And are there other people who maybe are starting to shift their behaviors because of this pandemic? The next piece is the value proposition. 
And this is the problem that you'll, you're solving for your customer. And I think um, what I've witnessed in all the businesses that have been able to successfully pivot um, have thought about how can I add value to my customer. They've had the attitude that I'm here to provide uh, good and service for other people. I'm here to benefit other people and enrich their lives and make their lives easier or better or more enjoyable, as opposed to people who have the attitude that the customer's there for them and how can I get people into, into my business. It's not how can I do business as usual, it's how can I change and I pivot to meet my customers' needs, which are changing. And this is why it's important to understand who our customers are, because then we can understand how we can help them solve their problems and what products and services we can offer to them to help them solve their problems. Um, and if anybody has not seen the movie Joy, um, please go watch it. I think you can watch it on Netflix. Um, great movie about an entrepreneur who invented uh, the self-ringing mop and was able to successfully market, market it on the QVC network, which is like the home shopping network for those of you who don't know. Um, but Joy uh, was a stay-at-home mom in the late 70s, I think. And, um, and she was uh, doing housework and was tired of mopping the floor and having to, to wring her mop out with her bare hands and decided there has to be another way to do this. So she invented the self-ringing mop and sold it on the QVC to other stay-at-home moms. So she had identified a customer, she had identified a need that that customer had, identified a way that she could enrich that, those people's lives, that she could solve a problem that they're having, and then she used a media that they were probably interacting with because they were at home during the day when QVC was airing, they probably came across it on, on TV at some point. And so as you're thinking about your value proposition, how is that changing? Um, how can you solve new problems that your customers have? And how can you solve them better than they're currently being solved? And I know uh, Colleen mentioned that she has people coming to her, um, asking her to make decisions for her, for them, basically, um, you know, how, how can you provide uh, options for these, these customers to, to get the information that they need to get so that they can make um, decisions on their own, that they can make the right decision for themselves? Um, how, can you, how can you help them with that? Uh, so examples of value propositions, of course, are Uber. I think it's probably the most famous. They provide uh, cheap rides in markets that usually didn't have taxi services or at times when taxis were um, not in service or at, at high capacity. So um, another good value proposition is Square. I'm sure some of you probably use Square in your, in your shops. They were able to um, uh, provide people the ability to go mobile with their um, taking credit card processing credit cards. So you could do it at fests, at shows, at, at farmers markets. Uh, they, they were also able to bring down the cost of point of sale systems, which were, which were very um, uh, expensive. Okay, so the next piece for us to think about are our customer relationships. And uh, so now we have, we know who our customers are. We know how we can help them. We have value for them. And now how do we tell them that we have this value for them? And this is uh, everything from your, your classic marketing and advertising to just uh, having a, a relationship with your customers. So how do you tell cust new customers that you have this um, solution to a problem that they're having? And how do you keep um, existing customers engaged? And is this something that's changing? You know, I always before uh, COVID-19, I would use the example that, you know, you know your customer and you know what kind of social media they're, they're interacting with. So if you, you know, if you were targeting a millennial customer, millennial age customer, you wouldn't, probably wouldn't put an ad in the newspaper because millennials aren't reading the newspaper. But if you were trying to reach the baby boomers, then the, the newspaper is probably the place that you would want to go because they're still interacting with the newspaper. Um, 
So who, what, what social media are your customers using? Um, are they watching television? Are they, um, do they use Google to search for new businesses? You know, how do you, um, how do you get to them? Are they, can you do a newsletter? Are they, um, do they like email blasts? Do they annoy, does it annoy them when they get a bunch of uh, email blasts? You know, what is it that your customers, uh, how do you, how do you get the word out to them? And how, and how is that changing? Perhaps uh, some people who weren't into social media might be now after all of this. Uh, distribution channels are how you deliver the product. Um, and this is one that has definitely changed for a lot of businesses uh, where you traditionally had a brick and mortar uh, retail or restaurant where somebody came in and uh, bought the product and uh, left with it. Now that's not happening. So there's more delivery, there's more uh, curbside delivery, there's more shipping. So what are, what are your distribution channels? How are you getting the good or service to uh, the customer and how is that changing? Uh, there may be, um, it seems like uh, a lot of people are ordering stuff right now. So it seems like your uh, services like FedEx and UPS are staying very busy. So how does that, uh, how's your customer change? Because perhaps people who weren't ordering a lot of stuff online are now. And is that going to, you know, you, you have to make some decisions now or, or some, you have to anticipate if that's going to stay the same. You know, after all the restrictions are lifted, are people still going to be ordering a lot of stuff? Is this going to be a new habit? So typically when we're thinking about our distribution channels, you know, um, one thing to think about is what is the industry standard? Um, so you, sometimes we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, however, if there is something that you can do that's different, that's going to benefit your, your customer, time to, time to brainstorm that. Like how can you get products and services to customers in uh, unique ways? All right. And finally, the last part of the front of our business is the revenue streams. And these are the products and services or bundles of products and services that you're actually selling to the client or to your customer in order to uh, to make money for your business. So you're changing, exchanging the value that you have, the problem that you have for um, a cash value for you and your, and your shareholders. So what are the products and services that you're offering? And now how, are, how is that changing? So we have, we've had to change a lot of services for sure. Um, restaurants are doing a lot of delivery or they're delivering through a third party. Um, so there's lots of uh, online ordering, um, you know, curbside pickup, um, this, uh, now this restaurant delivery service where there's no interaction, they just leave it on your doorstep and, and disappear. These are distribution things, but these are also um, revenue streams because you're selling that, that service as well. So are there, are there goods and services that might, um, you might be able to add now? In the back of our business, the area that the uh, customer usually doesn't see, I think the most important piece are your key partners. You know, who do you have to work with uh, to make it all work? Um, traditionally, this can be suppliers. I know supply change has been a big deal. So, um, do we need to make a supply shift? Are there is are there creative uh, solutions to supplying? Uh, different goods that you need in order to, to resell. Um, also suppliers could be people who other small businesses that you share a target market with. So maybe you're not directly in competition um, or you can be and you can create an alliance. Certainly um, if downtown Madison is a destination for tourism, it would make sense for like businesses to work together to attract those uh, customers from a, a greater radius, um, but also if there's um, businesses in the community who share your demographic, you can work together with your advertising or as referral sources for each other to have a symbiotic relationship where you're, you're bringing people to each other. And how are those changing? You know, who can you partner with now? 
key activities are the things that you have to do day in and day out. This is, uh, you know, ordering your goods, making your products. Um, and now we're, of course, we're adding uh, sanitizing everything um, and communicating to everybody that you're um, either, you know, following the sanitary guidelines or you're going above and beyond that. And then uh, uh, how, how are all of these activities changing? Your key resources are specifically the assets that you need to make your business work. Um, and then, so, you know, if you are a brick and mortar store, then you have a, uh, a, a, a place that people come and you have, you know, shelves and uh, point of sale system and all of these things that you need to make that store work. Well, if you're shifting to some other model where maybe you're online, then, then what do you need? Um, for that, maybe you need a, a better computer or uh, you need some um, education on how to, to market or how to get better um, search engine responses. And then there might be people that you can partner with to make that work, different marketing firms or other small business people who again, you share a, uh, a customer demographic with that you may be able to work together to help maximize each other's uh, reach on, on search engines and, and social media. And then finally, the last piece of our back of house is our cost structure. And typically you have whatever startup costs you have, and then you have your variable costs, which are tied directly to the sale of your product. So things like the materials you have to purchase to make your product or labor. So the more that you sell of your product, the higher that cost is going to be. And then you have your fixed costs, which are the things that are just the same day in and day out, whether you have a good month or not, whether um, the, the state, whether the governor says you can be open or not, you still have to pay these things. And then how do you price accordingly? Uh, this is probably a good time to rethink some pricing strategies and, uh, and certainly go back and look and say, okay, what are our costs um, going to be? Have things increased? I know a lot of people have taken some um, idle and PPP loans and, and any of part of that that you'll be paying back, the unforgivable portions, these are extra costs that you're going to have uh, down the road. So it's good to be prepared for that. And then any uh, cost of any personal protection gear that you now have to buy, hand sanitizer, if you need uh, face masks, um, whatever it is, extra cleaning supplies, extra sanitizers, all of these things are added costs that your business, current business model is probably not. Um, taking into consideration and certainly your pricing strategy isn't taking into consideration. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting um, to read recently has been the impact on restaurants and how a lot of re retail, small retail as well, but restaurants especially are very living very much uh, month to month, um, very thin margins. Uh, restaurants, it's been a, a highly competitive industry and restaurants have primarily competed on price. So prices are as really as low as possible as they can be in restaurants and the profit margins are, are very thin and overhead is very high. And one of the, one of the criticisms are that, you know, restaurants coming out of this uh, need to rethink their pricing and that if, you know, people want there to be restaurants, you know, we're going to have to pay more for, for those goods and services. And that's going to have to be um, a collective thing. You know, there can't be one restaurant that decides, okay, I'm going to charge more because I have to, because everybody's, you know, we're going to compete on price again and everybody's going to go to the place that's, that's cheaper. So as we move forward, what are our, um, what are our pricing strategies? How have our costs changed? And so that wraps up our business model canvas. Um, I encourage everybody to um, go through the exercise, um, bring in your employees, especially if you've, if you've gotten, you've got some employees and you maybe you've got the PPP loan and you're, you, they're on your payroll and you kind of don't have anything for them to do, maybe get them in there and get some strategy going and use them and get them some ownership in them. Also good to bring in any stakeholders that you may have. So 
not just employees, but you have family who work in the business or you have investors or, or kind of whoever, um, community leaders, anybody that, that, you, um, that you feel has a stake in your business or um, has, has good advice, a trusted person who's, whose opinion you trust, and brainstorm and, and figure this out. Um, the next step might be a, a formal business plan. It may not be. Um, I would certainly, um, as you change your, your business model, document some of that, set some new goals, and uh, uh, remember that the, the thing that is, has got you where you are, where you're still successful, you're still open, uh, is your, your flexibility and your business's agility and your ability to, to pivot and change um, when, when things change. This is uh, you know, certainly something that you can't control as a, as a business owner, so it's something you have to be prepared for or be able to react to. And that takes a certain uh, quality and a certain mindset, and I appreciate that. So, um, but the next step might be a formal business plan. You might want to um, go and get lending. You might want to restructure how you have your business um, uh, financed, um, or you may want to bring on other investors or something like that. If if it comes to that, please reach out to me and let me know. You know, this this is something that we help with all the time. And if you have any other questions, uh, please uh, feel free to send me an email. My email is in the uh, chat box. And also I, I put in there a video explaining the business model of Canvas as well, because this is a lot to go through. So if this is an exercise that you wanna go through, go back and, and watch that video and get some ideas on how this all works. But in each, each phase, each of these nine stages, think, how has this changed? How is, how's my customer changed? And what are new opportunities that maybe um, have revealed themselves? Um, a little bit about David, who's going to be speaking first. He's the CEO of Synoptis, and he's written two books on business IT alignment uh, with 20 years uh, with hands-on leadership experience in manufacturing, tier one automotive, uh, supply chain, higher education, engineering, nonprofits. Dave, I'm sure I'm missing some there, so feel free to step in if I did. Uh, he holds two master's degrees, and next year he's going to be completing a doctorate in business, uh, researching effective leadership development. Uh, from a personal perspective, uh, I've known Dave for a decade now, uh, and I can uh, absolutely vouch for uh, the uncanny ability that he brings uh, to the table and the perspective that he has on leadership development and on business development. Uh, so without further ado, David. We're going to talk about jobs to be done and how to segment your customer market. This, this is uh, uh, an evolution of a marketing strategy and something that we use in Synoptis to help anywhere from super small businesses to super large businesses. Uh, segment their market better, understand how their value delivery system, and transform their business so that um, um, they're able to meet some of those objectives that we just heard John and earlier that we heard the roundtable talking about. So what is jobs to be done? Well, uh, uh, Theodore Levitt was a, uh, uh, an economist who was famously quoted as saying, people don't want to buy quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. And the idea is that no one wants your product. They want what your product does. And we need to understand what a product does to be able to successfully segment a, a customer market and market to those people to reach them in an effective way. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that. So here's the traditional market analysis. And uh, you've probably, uh, if you've been through any sort of education about marketing or read the marketing materials, um, uh, marketing's tra traditionally looked at as four P's, price, product, position, and promotion. And what price, product, position, and promotion looks like might, and I want to help you go from that four P to what job is my customer try, uh, jobs to be done. And so that's what we're going to talk about transforming today. So I thought about doing that. Uh, there's been lots of, lots of things we could have talked about. Um, we could, we could have talked about uh, um, the uh, uh, coffee slash retail environment. Um, we heard a little bit about that. We could have talked about uh, uh, bed and breakfast. We could have talked about uh, tires and welding. We heard from a number of businesses 
um, today. Uh, I order a lot of pizza. Seems like I order more lately. And uh, so this is something that I felt comfortable speaking um, speaking on from a personal uh, perspective and offering you my, my point of view on pizza. So if we were gonna market pizza using 4P thinking, uh, price, uh, promotion, product, and placement. Uh, price, we might think, well, uh, what, what does the competition to, uh, what does our competition sell their pizza? Should we be selling at a discount? Should we be selling it more? How can we reduce our costs? How can we, how can we, um, are we gonna uh, uh, market, uh, you know, that uh, we've got a better price than our competition? Product, maybe we're marketing, oh, our pizza is a better quality than our, than our, uh, our, our competition, or we use um, stone brick, you know, stone uh, brick ovens versus we use uh, this type of oven, or, or um, we only use real cheese versus, right? And so you've probably heard this, this uh, um, type of marketing when it comes to pizza. We've talked about today, how can we reach more customers? And, and you'll, you've probably gotten spammed with emails saying, search engine optimization or go to social media or um, hit, the, hit Facebook um, and promotions. Should we send out coupons? Do we buy advertising on this platform or this platform? Uh, how do we reach, uh, uh, John talked a little bit about how do we reach millennials? And those are all valid, that's, that's that's marketing 101. What I want to do is, and, and that's, that's a foundation, I want to elevate that a little bit and expand on that with uh, thinking about jobs to be done. So jobs to be done is why do, why do customers buy a drill if you were selling drills? They want a hole. Why do customers buy a pizza? Well, I can't speak to all customers, but I can speak to why I buy a pizza. And I started thinking about this specifically for this example. And why do we buy pizza? Well, sometimes my wife's just too tired to cook. She says, man, she comes in the front room and says, I am, today has been a long day and uh, I'm tired. So we also, uh, once a week, my kids are teenagers. It's our family time tradition. On Fridays, we'll buy a pizza, and uh, this gives us an opportunity to interact with our teenage kids. We know they like pizza. We like pizza. They'll come down and eat, eat a meal with us if we uh, get pizza, and so that's our family time tradition. Sometimes we get pizza when we're celebrating a special event, right? Could be a birthday. Could be wedding anniversary. Could be... Um, Kids did great. Uh, my daughter's a freshman at Ivy Tech. Could be um, uh, uh, celebrating a, a particularly good grade. Um, the last reason that we order pizza is sometimes we're just looking for easy to order, right? I am tired. I'm mentally spent. It's been a long day. I need to, I, I want something that I can order fast, not have to think about, not have to engage with people. Um, and so those are, and so because those are my reasons for ordering pizza, I assume that other customers feel that way. So let's look at a couple of those and specifically apply the jobs to be uh, done thinking to two of those, celebrating something and easy to order. Well, how could you market if you didn't want to um, focus on price, product, uh, uh, placement or promotion, how could you create a more uh, a deeper relationship? And we've talked about our re customers' relationships. How could you create a deeper relationship with me when I'm celebrating something? Maybe you, you know, I've walked into restaurants and we've gone out for birthdays and I slightly say, hey, we're celebrating uh, my daughter's birthday or we're celebrating our anniversary. And um, just, just hoping that maybe they'll, you know, embarrass my daughter with a happy birthday song or something like that. But what if you were able to proactively engage with your customer? You don't have to offer them anything other than just, uh, 
hey, um, happy birthday, happy anniversary, happy whatever, whatever sort of event they're celebrating. Um, this would improve your uh, emotional connection, the depth of emotional connection with your customer simply by refreshing your brand, your name in their mind prior to that celebrating something event. Here's another idea. What if a pizza place, um, when they knew, and I wouldn't even have to mention, hey, it's my daughter's birthday, because they track this information, because you gather this information from your customers, you knew that uh, my daughter's birthday was uh, December 20th, which it is. Uh, and so on December 20th, I order a pizza and inside the, inside the box, I open up the lid and it says, happy birthday, Rebecca, right? All of a sudden, uh, and I didn't mention that, again, it deepens that emotional connection between your business and me. As a dad, I'm going, wow, they remembered my daughter's birthday. How cool is that? That generation of emotional connection creates a loyalty with your brand that doesn't exist if I have to solicit for, solicit for uh, 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 letting you know that uh, when my birthday is. It doesn't have the same emotional impact of sending them a coupon on their birthday. Or what if you, again, the, the same idea, what if on my wife's birthday uh, you put a cupcake uh, on top of the box to deliver with the cake? Not that I had to order it, and a cupcake might be a few, I don't know, 50 cents a dollar. Um, less than a dollar off coupon, but more of an emotional impact. You're trying to deepen those emotional relationships by understanding your customers, what they're trying to accomplish. I am not trying to accomplish a product. I am not trying to accomplish a pizza. I am trying to accomplish celebrating. Let's look at another Sometimes I'm looking for that easy to order product, right? I'm just, I'm emotionally, mentally spent for the day. It's been a long day running Synoptis and I also teach at Ivy Tech. So um, maybe I've had a long day at work and I just want to sit and veg in front of the TV. And so I'm looking for something easy to, easy to um, do. Imagine if I called my local pizza place and the caller ID popped up my customer record. And, and this is entirely possible to do. Pops up my customer record, and you're able to see that I always order a pepperoni pizza, a cheese pizza, and garlic bread. Always order that. And uh, you, you answered the phone and said, hey, pizza place. Um, uh, hey, David, uh, you want your usual tonight? Yeah, you just want the usual. Cool, we'll be there in half an hour. Uh, any anything to drink tonight, right? So you've you've now engaged with me on an emotional level. I am exhausted. You have solved that exhaustion problem. You are you are also making it easy to uh, upsell. Hey, I, sometimes you get a two liter Mountain Dew. You want to add that on, right? Um, or what if I could just text and set, and text the pizza place because I am just am done interacting with people for the day. I've had a long day. I send you a text and I say, hey, I want the usual. Again, this requires understanding what job is your customer trying to get done? So how do you do that? So understanding the job to be done for your customer requires that you collect data on your customer. It requires that you collect data on their transactions. It understands, or it requires that you ask your customers why they're ordering, ordering your product. It, un, it requires that you analyze that data and then act on that data. Now that sounds like a lot, but there's technological tools that facilitate that type of analysis, data gathering, so that you can build those emotional relationships with your customer that are going to generate the type of loyalty 
that can't be bought. Because when you're buying, when, when you're focusing on product placement, um, price and promotion, you're in a race to the bottom. John talked about that, right? You're lowering prices, you're lowering prices, you're undercutting your competition and the margins get thinner and thinner. But when someone has an emotional connection with your business, when someone is, um, uh, feels something when they think about your business, then they'll pay more because they have that relationship. So we're gonna talk about um, uh, Cameron. Cam I'm gonna introduce Cameron. Cameron is uh, the Chief Technology Officer for Synoptis. Cameron and I work together. I do the business side analysis and Cameron provides uh, a platform to help automate uh, uh, those type of, of services to um, uh, uh, help your customer establish those emotional um, emotional connection. Let me uh, stop sharing real quick. So let me tell you a little bit about Cameron. So uh, we focus primarily on on Salesforce development. Um, Salesforce is a customer relationship management solution. It is. Um, it is uh, uh, one of their headquarters in Indiana. It's one of the largest technology providers uh, or largest technology companies in Indiana. And Cameron, outside of the people that work for Salesforce, um, Cameron has 14 Salesforce certifications, which is the third most uh, in the state of Indiana. So I always joke that uh, um, Cameron is, uh, uh, if you can't do it on Salesforce, it can't be done. So Cameron's one of my favorite people to work for, one of the smartest people I know, and also um, is the guy who understands the business. So he's not gonna inundate you with uh, a bunch of uh, technology terms that are gonna get too deep and uh, take it away, Cameron. So Dave, that was a great overview of jobs to be done. Uh, so when the rubber meets the road for your business, how are you going to get at this data? And more importantly, what are you going to do with it? How do you, how do you take this and make it something actionable? So there's a couple different pieces that Dave spoke about. And for each of those pieces, there are specific tools out there that can do what you need uh, to do in order to either obtain that data or take action. So if you need to collect data on your customers, there are a class of tools out there called marketing automation tools that can help with this. And you're probably familiar with a number of them. Uh, let's say MailChimp, I'm sure many people are familiar with that, or Marketo, or it, there's, I mean, you name it, there's so many of them out there. There's also a class of tools that are called, uh, or you could call them online storefronts or, or stores. This includes mobile app stores as well. Uh, where this is where you're showcasing your product. Now, depending on your business, you may not have exactly an online storefront, but oftentimes you'll have something similar where you're presenting your product. You need to ask your customers why. You need to be able to get at that, uh, you need to have that contact with your customers and build that relationship to the point where you understand where they're coming from. Again, when, when Dave talks about you're buying a pizza, and you're not really buying a pizza, you're accomplishing a goal, whether that's getting an easy meal or whether that's celebrating something. You need to know why your customers are doing what they're doing with your business. And getting at that why uh, can be done with relationship management tools. You need to analyze that data, which can be done with uh, some sort of reporting system or something that can take all of this data and bundle it together and present it to you in a format that you can digest rather than just looking at, you know, row after row in Excel or, or something like that. And then you need to act on that data. And certainly all of these tools that we've mentioned here, all of these classifications of tools, they can help you do that. But ultimately the onus is on you to take that action. The tools are only going to help you do that, uh, but it's your job and, and that's why you're in business is to take all this data and figure out where you want to go with your business. Now I've listed here, there are, when people hear Salesforce, a lot of times if they have heard of Salesforce before, what they think of is, 
oh, okay, it's, it's some sort of web app that you go online and use, or it's a tool that you can use. Salesforce is actually a suite of products similar to, uh, if you think about Microsoft Office, you've got Word and PowerPoint and Excel. There's a whole host of different tools in Office. It's the same thing with Salesforce. If you're looking for a marketing automation tool, Pardot and Marketing Cloud both fit your needs depending on specifically what you're looking for. Commerce Cloud gives you a nice online storefront. And in fact, they've partnered with Apple so that you can spin up a mobile app with your storefront and you bypass a lot of the review process that uh, Apple does for apps. With Salesforce Essentials, which includes CRM and service, you're able to deliver next level customer service through multiple channels, whether that's uh, phone, email, and a whole host of other channels. And you're also able to implement relationship management with your customers where you can make sure that you're staying in contact with them, see what problems they've had over time, and, and uh, make sure that you are keeping a pulse on, on what your customers are doing. And then ultimately, again, acting on the data, that is, that is up to you. All of these tools can help you do that, but it's really up to you. Now I'm gonna focus on Salesforce Essentials, which is kind of the core of Salesforce. It's, it was their first product and it's really the one that uh, most businesses are lacking in many ways. So the nice thing about Salesforce Essentials is that, you know, if you have an existing marketing automation tool or an existing uh, online storefront, most likely Salesforce can already integrate with it. I've given some examples here where, okay, you're using Constant Contact and you're using Shopify. Salesforce will talk to those. Or if you're using HubSpot for your marketing automation and WooCommerce for your, uh, for your online storefront, you're more than welcome to integrate with those. Now, we're gonna do a sample scenario here. So I've got this sample business owner, Chuck Jones, who owns Hydrographic Traffic, which is an online store that sells custom shoes. So it puts these cool graphics on shoes, and maybe does something to make them better in some way, or, or maybe it's just designs. Now, Chuck is looking for relationship management. And ultimately, he's looking to get uh, at that jobs to be done information. He's trying to understand why his customers are using, uh, or are, are coming to his store and are buying his products. What are they accomplishing through his products? Now, Unfortunately, with just 15 minutes available, we don't have time to go through everything, but hopefully by giving you a little sliver and showing you some of the potential of what we can do, you can visualize what this would look like if we were to get all of this information together and really drill down into why Chuck has these customers. So Chuck has MailChimp for marketing automation, and then he has Magento for his online storefront. And he's looking to do Salesforce Essentials uh, in order to implement both CRM to keep track of his customers and to manage contact and to implement service as well if his customers have an issue. He wants to know what they've ordered, he wants to know what support they've been given in the past uh, and what types of problems they've had in the past as well. So the first thing that Chuck is going to do after he goes to his, uh, gets his Salesforce instance is he's going to go to the App Exchange. Now the App Exchange is Think of it as an app store for Salesforce. Uh, Mark Benioff, who founded Salesforce, he actually came up with the term app store and gave it to Steve Jobs to use for the first uh, iPhone. When we get to the app store, what Chuck is gonna do is he's gonna search for MailChimp because he's going to want to integrate his MailChimp marketing automation data into Salesforce. And it's as easy as searching for it, finding the results, clicking get it now, and then you're good. Um, we're going to skip the login process, just I, I've logged into Salesforce already. But you can see here that once he clicks install, it's going to begin an installation process that will take his marketing automation data located within MailChimp and it's going to set up that connection within Salesforce. Once Chuck is within Salesforce with MailChimp installed, what he's going to do first is we're going to see that the first thing that happens is all of his uh, account and contact data that he has within his marketing automation tool is now conveniently located within Salesforce. He can do the same thing with his Magento e-commerce data and that would bring in the other side of it. So he needs all of his order data there 
coupled with his marketing contact information to give a true 360 degree view of what his customers are working on. Now what he's going to do first is he's going to build a report. The idea is he needs to be able to digest this information that's been brought in from, say, or from MailChimp into Salesforce. Now you can see here we have MailChimp data already, contacts, accounts, and MailChimp subscribers. If you're familiar with MailChimp, subscribers are a part of that uh, suite of tools. Now, one of the real powers of Salesforce is the incredibly intuitive reporting capabilities. So I'm just gonna remove the columns here that Chuck really doesn't need as a part of this report. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to add in some of that MailChimp data that we have. So for example, one of the pieces of data that MailChimp collects for you is customer interests. So we're gonna add that customer interests to this report to see, okay, we've got our users here, we've got our customers, and we wanna see what their interests are. Now, after I've added their interests to this report, what I can do is I can then group this within Salesforce. This allows me to see everyone who shares similar interests grouped together on my report. So Chuck can see at a high level what customers are interested in what. I'm gonna then save and run this report and then get a full picture with all my data instead of just a sample that comes up uh, when I'm building that report. Now, I can take this even further. You see at the top, there's an add chart button there. It's incredibly convenient when you have a report to just click add chart. Uh, and it's gonna do the heavy lifting for us as far as analyzing this data and making sure that we have this in a digestible format. Now maybe a donut is more convenient for my purposes just because I'm trying to see out of everyone, what of my customers are interested in certain things. And the results may be surprising to me. For example, the largest percentage of my customers are interested in Nike. I didn't realize it, but you know, Chuck's all, most of his shoes that he's customizing are Nike. These are people who are Nike enthusiasts who really just wanted to customize their Nike shoes. So already, even though we only have one piece of data that we're integrating here, we can already see, oh, one of the needs that my products are fulfilling are allowing people to show off their Nikes. I already am gleaning insights from this, even though this is just one dimension of data, when more likely I'll have many different sources of information that I can aggregate and then cut that data up and slice it in certain ways to gain insights on what my customers are actually doing. This is really just the tip of the iceberg. So I've given some other examples here of some things that we could do. For example, how do people's interests in MailChimp correlate with geographic data based on shipping in Magento? So is it that all of our Nike fans, are they all located in one area? Is it, uh, are they all together? Do I market to them as a block? Is there some other way that I can group those uh, in order to get uh, better insights into what my customers are interested in? I could also set up email to case, meaning I set up a support email that goes straight into Salesforce. Because I have my customer's email address already, I see they've ordered three things before. They say they have a problem with the black shoes that they ordered, and I see they've ordered a pair of white shoes, a pair of red shoes, and a pair of black shoes. And so I know exactly what product they're talking about. They didn't even need to give me their order number. And I can see historically that, you know, they've had issues with every shoe before. So I'm going to apologize for them and say, hey, I'm really sorry that you've had problems with all three of your orders. Hey, I want to give you a 50% discount for your next time you're shopping at our store. You, you are increasing that relationship and you are increasing that emotional connection, just like Dave was talking about. Again, there's so many more things that we could do here, whether that's marketing journeys or one of the things Dave mentioned was uh, telephone integrations where your customers call your business and immediately you have all of the information up on your screen that, they, uh, that you have on them. And so you can contact them and say, hey, how's it going, Dave? I, I know that uh, we last spoke about two months ago and you were looking at X, Y, Z. Did you ever find something that met your needs for that? Um, so on and so forth. So there's so much more that you can do here that we just unfortunately don't have time to get into, but hopefully this shows you just a sample of what is possible. Now what's next here? So if you're looking to uh, 
dive a little bit deeper into this or you want to know more, I've put our contact information uh, up on this page for both David and myself, whether you're looking for uh, more information on jobs to be done or on Salesforce in general. There's also some resources here. So Salesforce has uh, work.com resources, which are specifically for small businesses uh, throughout these changing times with COVID-19. Uh, and then if you're interested in learning more about Salesforce on your own, visit trailhead.salesforce.com. There's all sorts of trainings there uh, that are absolutely free to use, and you can even get a sample board where you can uh, poke around yourself and see what you think. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to David. Yeah. Uh, feel free to dive into that and we think it's a great tool um, and uh, hope it brings a lot of value to you, to your organization. Um, next up, we're doing another panel. This one is with John Myers, Molly Dodge, and, and Linda Blues and I will hand it over to uh, them. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to be with all of you today. It's great to see you even though we, we can't really see each other in 3D, and it's been a while. Um, my portion of the panel, uh, I, I was just hoping to garner from, from all of you um, as your ideas on how Ivy Tech might be able to help your small businesses. And this can be a conversation that, that continues on. Um, I just wanted to be very over in saying that Ivy Tech is, um, working with the governor's office um, and, and the Department of Education and Commission for Higher Ed in terms of uh, offering programs and services as part of rapid recovery. And so we are so fortunate to have a campus of Ivy Tech here in Jefferson County that serves both Jefferson and Switzerland County. And so I just, I wanted just to say that, that we care about you as small businesses. Uh, we want to be sure that we offer programs and services that you need during this time. Thank you, Molly. Um, so from the Chamber perspective, obviously, um, we're, we're also here to provide resources for you all um, and what you need. We've launched the um, the page on our website for coronavirus resources, and most recently um, from that, a resiliency page to talk about, you know, what reopening looks like and best practices, um, some sample signage, um, and links to businesses that can help provide sourcing for you, um, whether that's uh, Kaler Welding or Industrial Supply Company, MPS Printing, um, or even New York Cleaners, who uh, is doing some uh, interesting things with um, you know, washable, reusable masks that and a service that they can provide for you and for your business there. Um, so I just want to um, throw it out uh, to everybody. We'll, we'll hop over to John here in just a second, um, but be thinking as John, uh, you know, tells us a little bit about what ISBDC has to offer, um, that, uh, you know, think about what resources that you do need, um, and we'll kind of open it up to everybody here in just a minute. John? Thanks, Lindsay. I had to unmute there. <laughs> so I'm, I'm the business advisor for Jefferson County with the Indiana Small Business Development Center. And we're a, a free service that's confidential for any small business or anybody who wants to start um, a small business. We're part, we're the Southeast region. We're part of a statewide network of 10 regions. Um, and we really are a, a really strong team. Um, we have a lot of resources in our network. Um, my personal background is restaurant business. I was a, a, I've owned two restaurants and I've done some property management. Uh, so I understand um, what everybody's going through with the, the ups and downs with their small business. Um, in, in 2008, my, I had a business in Columbus and a third of Columbus was flooded. Um, and our business was indirectly uh, affected by that. So I understand the, uh, you know, the, the not knowing what to do, not knowing when things are going to get back to normal, not knowing what normal is going to look like. And I, I, I understand um, all of those things. Uh, statewide, our, our goal is to have an impact on small businesses uh, and to deal with any issue that you might be having. Um, 
like I said earlier, we do a lot of business planning. We work with a lot of startups, but we're not limited to that. Um, if you have a business and you want to grow or you've, you've hit a rut and you just want to think about how do I, how do I plan for the future? How do I be a little more creative? How do I identify new markets? And we're there to help you get some guidance with that. And, and we're not the, um, the end all be all, you know, I don't know everything, but I do have an, a, a network of other people in the state uh, that I can reach out to. And, um, and also I may just refer you to some people who are even on the call here today that, you know, Hey, this might be the best resource for you. Maybe you need to go over to the chamber and, and talk to them, or maybe you need to go talk to, to uh, David and, and Cameron, you know, but that, uh, that's what we're here for is to, uh, to help small businesses get in the right direction. Uh, before COVID-19, the state was really working on exporting. Uh, so we have a great plan where we can help small businesses who want to break into export markets, help you with writing a business plan for exporting, and help you identify some of those markets. And we can uh, uh, have a program where we, we can pay a consultant, an exporting consultant, to work with you to, to create that plan. And in some cases, we have also paired people with uh, master's students to work on those exporting plans. Um, and we can also provide uh, some grants for um, trade shows for exporting. So if you wanna go see, you wanna go to a trade show and, and um, that's gonna help you export, we can provide some, some reimbursement uh, funds for that. Um, we're also working on a grant in our region uh, to help people affected by COVID-19 to pay for advertising expenses marketing expenses getting uh, as you rebound and reopen and uh, potentially some bookkeeping uh, fees to, to help track the uh, the loan money that you might have might have gotten so that's us in a nutshell and, and please feel free to reach out to me for for anything I'm, I'm happy to help any way that i can thanks john um so uh i think john made a really good point with um being able to throw you know, back to other organizations. I think everybody here uh, has been really good about working with each other. Um, Madison Main Street Program, Chamber, Visit Madison, um, we're all here to help you all. So we want to hear from you all. Um, what are some resources that you're having difficulty finding or some resources that um, you, you know, you may uh, need at this point uh, that you'd like to see more readily available to you? Roy, I, I know that you're on the call from MPS Printing. Um, would you mind uh, talking just real briefly about um, what MPS has been doing as far as templates for signage and the importance of some of the things that you all have been offering? Yeah, absolutely. We have uh, we've done a couple of signages for uh, some of the local doctors um, in, in Milton and Kentucky and, and Madison, um, just because I think with so much changing and as we kind of move along to the schedule of what we're doing and, and trying to get you know, back to everything being as close to what, I guess, the new normal. Um, you know, we've done a couple of different ones as those those procedures and have changed. And uh, we have a couple of options that are, you know, standalone kind of just, you know, what any business would use. But then we've also done and can do some that are very specific to, to you know, what they need. Um, we also have been doing some banners um, and some, some outdoor signage as well. So, um, you know, whether it's, you know, flyers or, or, or whatever, um, you know, some, some product flyers that have been going out with, with food and that type of thing that kind of give a description of what they're doing in that facility to try to make sure that they're, they're being very mindful of the issues that we all have. So, um, and absolutely are, you know, capable of, of doing just about anything that would get the message out there. So signage and communication with customers and employees are, are, are um, you know, very, very big piece of this. Um, and, and we want to make sure that our and, businesses and, have those resources. And those things are very fluid and changing with, you know, right. as, we, as we proceed in the schedule. And as I mentioned, we're, we've done a few of those and then we've had to go back and address the, the changes. And so, um, you know, whether it's a window, window sign, a, you know, a poster or a banner or whatever, um, those options are available and, and we can customize that with, you know, whatever needs to be done specific for the facilities. And we've done that for a couple here locally already. So. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So from the chamber perspective, I know we're trying our best to anticipate what resources our businesses might be needing um, during this time, but we also want to be very responsive to specific needs of businesses and kind of tailor the resources to what you all need um, specifically. So 
If there is a resource we're not providing that you need, um, let us know if, um, you know, if, if you just need contact information from somebody or you need connected um, with any of the other uh, organizations on this call, um, we're happy to help um, guide you in that direction um, and that sort of thing. I'm going to kick things over back over to, um, to David and um, go, from, go from there. David? Great. So thanks everyone so much for your participation today. I found this very enjoyable. If you have any questions for me about uh, uh, any of the analysis we talked about, um, we're, happy to, we're happy to help out. Really appreciated everyone sharing today. Um, everybody stay healthy.